Good morning. It's 10 o'clock. Welcome to Lincoln. We're live. We're here every Sunday morning from 10 until 11. And of course, we've got a lot of guests for you this morning. Uh, we've got artworks. Going to talk about the artwork summer program. The second half of the show got doc Dr. John Thomas. We're going to try to get into the mind of some of these teenage criminals that are roaming the streets of Cincinnati. Why are they doing this? Why are these teenagers murdering people? It's got to be an answer. And we'll try to get to the bottom of that answer on the second part of the show with Dr. John Thomas. But first, we've got Tamara Harkavy, uh, Jared Jamison in the studio. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Last week, they had a big article in the Enquirer about the artworks, the murals that are going around the city. Tell us a little bit about it and uh, uh, tell us what's going on with uh, some of your events. you got murals here in Roseline even. Do tell us what's going on with that. We have a mural right up the street in uh, partnership with um, a company called ServePro. But the overriding, the overriding idea is uh, three things. One is we're, we're employing teenagers, so hopefully we're helping um, with that idea of anti-violence and working with kids from all over the city. Um, we are beautifying neighborhoods and picking walls that mm -hmm. were once scarred and now become really great works of I know, art. And, and that's some great work, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the, the first uh, pieces of work that I've seen was over there on William, William Howard Tav. Uh, you familiar with that mm -hmm. area right there? Mm -hmm. And that's, that looks good. Murals have been uh, part of, of sort of a public art form for, for many years, not at not so much in Cincinnati, actually in the 70s, there was a big mural movement, but in mm -hmm. Los Angeles and in Philadelphia and in San Francisco, and they can make scarred neighborhoods beautiful places and bring people down there. Mm -hmm. So creating economic benefits. And then we do something additionally by working with kids and teenagers. And I've known Jared since he was uh, 14, 15. Uh, yeah, about that long. Uh, actually, I, I didn't get you know, get to start doing the arts until I was 17. I didn't know about it. I knew about the program, but I didn't apply for some reason. And uh, it's just an awesome opportunity. Uh, I spent three years as an apprentice artist, uh, working with professional artists from the city as well as across the nation. And then this year is my first year actually teaching, and uh, we're working down on uh, the Central Business uh, District mural, which is at Barry Rothschild's uh, mm -hmm. law office. And uh, we have a project manager, Tim Parsley, and the other, Kate, uh, the other teaching artist is Kate Holterhoff. And uh, we just have a great crew and of kids. And how many kids? 11. Now, how, 11 do you get these, how do you find these kids? Uh, they have the interview, actually. There's a whole interview process where they send in a portfolio. Uh, they have to go down to the Contemporary Arts Center. We have, hold interviews with uh, other artists that, are, that work with the program, parents, and just friends of the program. Mm -hmm. And uh, the kids interview. And they're judged on their, their artistic score. They had to do a, um, a self-portrait and a still life that they turn in, as well as some of their other um, works that they've done during school and stuff like that. Now, I know the mayor's behind this also, and I guess the city is, you know, you know pouring mayor, some money Mayor in. Mallory called us into his office, and we're like, oh, my God, what do we do wrong now? <laughs> and uh, called us into his office, and I have this idea. I just got back from Philly. There's murals everywhere. Can you guys do this? We want you to hire kids. Mm -hmm. We want you to make murals. And uh, we said, yeah, we'd love to do this. Um, and then some serendipitous things happened, and uh, UBS Financial Services came into the picture with some money. The city put a little money in. Procter & Gamble put some money in. The business owners put some money in. And we were able to hire, there's about 90 kids working on murals, 160 kids working on 12 projects. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do murals. We're going to do murals for years to come, I hope, in neighborhoods. All right, we need to take a quick break, and then we'll come back and maybe get a look at some of the murals you, that you are going some? on around town. Oh, and plus, we'll find out if the kids get paid and how can they get ready for next summer. Great. And uh, maybe some parents can call in and get some information for their children. We'll take a quick break, I think. I don't see anybody there. But uh, we'll take a break, and we'll come right back and uh, maybe get some uh, photographs of some of the uh, 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 murals that uh, are around town. Okay, we'll do that. We'll take a quick break and we'll come right back. Lincoln, we're live right here on It's 38. Back in a moment.
We're back live. Lincoln, we're live is the program. And uh, as I said before, Tamara Harkavy, Jared Jameson from Artworks, and they've got a great summer program going on. And uh, kids are, uh, they're making money. They, uh, you hire these kids, they work, and they have fun drawing and making money at the same time. You can't beat that. Can't now, beat you said the mayor called you in. They, uh, they threw in some money and uh, got this program underway. Now, can you show us some of the... Uh, uh, works that the kids are working on this summer. Can work, we the work put something project, up on the screen? Project. Let's see what we have here. I don't know where it is. Okay, what is that right there? Actually, this was from last year. This was uh, the Pleasant Ridge mural at Mulaney's a Pharmacy in Pleasant Ridge. Okay. I was actually a part of this project last year. And uh, this is a, a completed one. This was from the last year's summer program. That looks good. That, that's fantastic. It's probably I mean, that's, what, what gave uh, Mayor Mallory the idea that uh, maybe artworks could get involved. In I'm that. telling you. That, yeah. I mean, that, that's unbelievable. It's pretty okay. gorgeous. Yeah. Let's uh, see another one here. We have anything else we can throw up there? To, uh, I mean, th that's fantastic work there. Look at that. This is the Blue Manatee yeah, Mural. Blue Jared, Man you were part of that, Yeah, I was too. part of that one, too. I think I wasn't there. I was probably in class when they took this photo. It's Blue Manatee but, uh, <laughs> Bookstore. It's yeah. in Oakley. This was uh, 2005, uh, the fall of 2005 for uh, Blue Manatee Bookstore. And do we have any others up there we can show? Now, this is nice. That is um, a that remnant cool. of a mural that we did in the 90s. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was done in 1997. Mm -hmm. uh, it's near Finley Market. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of the first projects we did as an organization, as artworks, and uh -huh. kind of makes me feel pretty proud that that's still standing there. It's, I'll it's tell you, that's beautiful. pretty gorgeous. Beautiful. Yeah. I'm you. I think yeah. we have some more. I'm not sure. Let's see if there's any new ones. Okay. But I'll tell you what, that's fantastic. Now, I know some parents uh, are watching, and they say, my kids are always drawing mm -hmm. different things. Mm -hmm. And how can they get ready for next year if they want to go through the interview process and maybe become a part of Artworks? What can parents do to get their kids ready for next year? And where do you register? How do you sign up? Directly, it's go to our website, artworkscincinnati.org. Mm -hmm. So that's where it's a pretty good website. You can find out a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Typically, interviews are in February, March, April. Okay. Um, but I think we're going to try and do this more year-round. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we will contact kids who are interested sooner than later, and, and you can send us an email or call us. Okay, give the website address again. Artworkscincinnati.com. And org. what's the phone number? 333-0388. Uh, All right. Now... Uh, I, when the mayor called you in, how do you find places that you want to do the uh, You know, that, that's uh, like the greatest question. Well, I think we put out this, there's a form on our website, and interested communities or building owners or individuals can fill out this form and request a mural. Mm -hmm. So the mural request process is, it's, it's a little bit uh, bulky. We're mm -hmm. asking people to fill things out and give us information so that they can be ready to okay. get a mural, because it's a, it's a community participation process. Mm -hmm. We don't want to just walk into your neighborhood and say, hey, we're painting a mural. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. We're, we're painting a mural. Come tell us what you like. Okay. Get involved. Mm -hmm. Help make it real. Okay. And, so I guess you um, could even go us. to some of the community council meetings. We've been working with them, <laughs> okay. too. So it's, uh, it, it's, I drive around. I'm sure you drive around and go, ooh, mural wall. Ooh, yeah. that would yeah, be a yeah, great yeah, mural yeah. wall. Yeah. Yeah. And so then you write it down, and then you go from <laughs> my there. My little camera in my purse. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Right. And how do you do you decide what you're going to put up there? Once you find the spot, how do you decide what's going there? Actually, it's the, uh, the team of teaching artists. Uh, there's, uh, it consists of a project manager, you know, sometimes one teaching artist, a junior teacher. And um, this year, we, we made the program more of an, uh, an apprenticeship program. So mm -hmm. actually, the project manager is designing the, the design. Ba and then, based on what the community Yeah, based on the community. For, yeah, right. after the... Uh, the meetings and stuff like that and then that's how we go around it and then the students are then you know told what to paint that's a true apprenticeship this year instead of some years in the past we actually had apprentices part of the design process but that really didn't get us uh -huh. you know yeah. we had deadlines to meet and we just went the, around in circles but the mural that yeah. you're working on this year mm -hmm. uh for the for the rothschild building is situated on race and central parkway directly across where the new School for Creative Performing Arts okay. is going okay. to be. Okay. And the, the entire building is wrapped with kids' faces mm. and um, then sort of um, silhouettes of different kinds of activities in the arts, yeah, from photography mm. to singing. To, okay. So it's, it's really about 
being creative and the arts. And it really is like almost a welcome sign for the new school and what's going to be happening in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, if you have some uh, locations that might be yeah. good locations for a mural, give us a call right now at 513-381-3838. We'll write them down. And who knows, next year you could see a mural in your neighborhood. So give us a call right now at 513-381-3838 if you have any uh, suggestions as to where we might be able to put up a mural in your neighborhood. Now, after what type of process do you send the, I mean, do you give them a test? Do you see if the kids can draw? And how does that work? Uh, we, we had 400 kids apply to work 400 with us. and you only ended up with? 160. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so what's the process? Just over half are working on murals. The, the process is an application, a drawing test, which is a self-portrait and a still life, a recommendation from somebody other than mm -hmm. a parent. Oh, my son's a great artist. Doesn't count. <laughs> mm -hmm. Doesn't count. Mm -hmm. um, and an interview. Okay. After all that is said and done, and, it, and, and that's, that's setting the bar pretty high because this is job training. So the very first thing they have to do is really mm -hmm. how any of us would go about in yeah. getting a job. Um, after the interview process, then we sit down and we begin to look for the right kids and, and making the right project and putting kids into the right mm -hmm. kinds of pro you know, into the right place. So we're setting people up for success. And this is just like a job. I mean, they have yeah. to it's report in at a certain time. Yep, they work is. so many hours mm -hmm. a day, and then they get off. And so mm -hmm. this is tr giving them training or real-life experience, yeah. you it know, being to work on time and getting a paycheck. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then what happens if you're not at work on time? And, and yeah, what happens yeah. if uh, you get some slackers there that well. <laughs> don't know, uh, that can't comprehend uh, time? And, you know, I know some people like that that yeah. just don't get it when it comes right. to time, and they're always late. What do you do when they... Well, they get, they get three absences, and after those three absences, they're, they're turning at it. No okay, kidding. Okay. Yep. Have you ever had to do that? Uh, I, I've never had it on one of my projects. Well, of course not. I'm sure <laughs> I have Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have to but, yeah. do it, but we, we really only have about a 2% attrition rate. Yeah, yeah. So programs like this, that, that's pretty Kids phenomenal. Kids really... If you go through what you have to go through to get this job, that means you really want yeah, to yeah. do this. And it's not something you that you're going there. in kicking and screaming. Yeah, and yeah. This is something that you really want to do. But these kids are outside working, and it is hot yeah, outside. Yeah, yeah. And it is, you know, they're on imagine. scaffolding, and I want to, my heart goes out to them. It is incredible to see mm -hmm. what these, these kids are doing. And think mm -hmm. about it, Lincoln. These murals are going to be there for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So you could have a, a kid in a program like Artworks walking down the street, you know, I mean, the, the, the legacy of yeah. it is is pretty tremendous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, you can imagine. I mean, they might be there, and these kids mm -hmm. might have kids. And they can say, "Look, mommy or daddy did that." Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. mm -hmm. But so. that's great. I mean, and like I said, it it really stands out in the neighborhood, and it really looks good. I mm -hmm. mean, it's better than some graffiti up on a wall somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, uh, to show our appreciation towards you having us, uh, we brought you our shirt this year. Uh, so we're presenting this to you, oh, the wow. Artworks T-shirt. Great, great. That uh, we actually had. We had our Artworks Day uh, last Friday, which is like the... All right. And I guess they designed this shirt also. That drawing in the center and that sort of yellow spot is, is one of the self-portraits. Kids have to That's turn great. in a self-portrait. That's so. great. Okay, we'll take a quick break and we'll come right back yeah. to find out more on Artworks. And then don't forget, coming up on the second half of the show, Dr. John Thomas can we get into the mind of the teenage criminals that are roaming the streets of Cincinnati? Back in a moment. And we're back live. Lincoln Where Live is a program. And coming up in a few minutes, Dr. John Thomas, and we'll explore the mind of a teenage criminal back. Uh, he'll be coming up in just a few minutes. Now, who funds the Artworks program? I mean, it takes a lot of money. So where do you get the money? From city, from the donors, or what? I, first of all, I have to say that I think Cincinnati is one of the most generous communities that I've ever had the pleasure of being involved with. Um, we have great leadership. At, at the city level but between the mayor and Mr. Tarbell mm -hmm. um, who've been very supportive of artworks and, and Roxanne Qualls when she was mayor actually got us going. Um, but we rely on corporate donors such as UBS and Convergys, Fifth Third Bank, 
um, all the way down to individual donors. And, and uh, we do campaigns every year to adopt an apprentice, and it costs us about $1,500 a kid to employ them in the summer. Um, to working with guys like SurfPro up the street who, who provide in-kind services so that we can get the job done. Um, it is a, not an inexpensive yeah. program, but it has an economic impact and a gain that I think is, is important enough to make the effort to keep going and to keep doing what we do. All right, time. let's go to the telephones. Uh, let's go to Priscilla. Priscilla, good morning. How are you? Good morning to you and your guests. Uh, I have a question. I was wondering uh, what's the age limit because I have two older nephews oh, that who can draw and they, they express their art well, their artwork very well. So I was wondering what was the age limit. We hire kids from the age of fourteen to to the age of nineteen. Yeah, nineteen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I wanted to make a comment, too. I used to live at Kennedy Heights, and I saw the picture in Pleasant Ridge. That is a wonderful job. It is oh, so thanks. breathtaking. Thanks. I grew up with Kennedy like Heights, that, too. <laughs> up against the um, walls like that, and just keep up the good work. Thank you. Thanks for your call. Thank you. Well, you know, uh, Jared grew up in Kennedy Heights, so I know uh, you've got to be proud yeah, of that. Yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, what projects are you working on now, Jared? Uh, just the just the Central Business District, Maryland, okay. Rothschild that, Law Office. And what about the Arts uh, Center? Aren't you supposed to do something in the bathrooms or something? Oh, that's that's another project. That's, Actually, okay. that's the water closet project, and they're, okay. they're redesigning the uh, bathrooms in the... Um, the Cincinnati Art Museum. Okay. Actually, that's another project. It's called, and now it's, they, they named it Nature yeah. Calls. Oh, it's called, yeah, it's called Nature Calls, actually. Okay. <laughs> so we yeah, also have a sense of stuff. humor. Yes. Yeah, so. But, I mean, I think this is a great program, and uh, you, you're employing some uh, youth in the community. Mm -hmm. You're keeping them occupied, and so they can't get out there and get in trouble. You know, I get calls on my radio show all the time. People, we need jobs for these teenagers. We need something for them to do. Mm -hmm. And you've got this program, and I think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, let's go to Sarita. Sarita, how are you? I'm good. Good morning. How are you? Pretty good. Good. Um, my whole reason for calling this morning is because I was within the group from the very first artwork. Oh. I thought that name was and familiar. I was in Artworks 95, and I just wanted to say good morning to Miss Harkavy. Hi, Sarita. How are you? I'm good. It's good to see that artwork is still within the city. And I'm, wild. I'm happy to say that. And I can say at um, every interview, I still mention the fact that I was definitely within artworks. And, and it's done amazing things for my life as far as me being a, a, a young woman now. So now I'm 25 years old. <laughs> Then I was 14. <laughs> what, did, what project did you work on? What project did you work on? I worked in the performance tent. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Come visit yes. us. Well, I'm, just, I'm just happy to see that things are still good. Thank well, you. it seems like it, uh, it was worthwhile for you. You seem like a fine citizen in this community. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Definitely. Thank well, thank you. You all have a good morning. Uh, you Thanks for your call. All right. I mean, that's got to make you that's feel good. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, the first, first artworks program. We had 80 kids, maybe, maybe 80 kids. We had four projects. One of them was a performance project um, where they did a stomp thing and a review, okay. and we didn't know what we were doing. She's, uh, we had the best time. Though. She was 14 then, 25 now, yeah. and you were even then. She's still, so you've been around quite a while. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You've been around quite a while and still going strong, yeah. I might add. Better and better. And you're both Walnut Hills graduates. How about yep. that? Yep. Walnut, Walnut Hills, Hills continues to uh, uh, put out some good students there. Its legacy is pretty tremendous. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, how do you decide what content to paint? I thought I asked that question before, but we'll ask it again. Look, let me give you a quick uh, like synopsis. Part of what the mayor would like us to do is to engage communities. Mm -hmm. okay. So each community has a different focus. Some communities want us to talk about history. Mm -hmm. um, Over the Rhine is a great example. There's a mural that has an old-time photograph of when it was a canal okay. that's on the, um, uh, the Central Park yeah. Point Race. It's the Barlow Motors building mm -hmm. okay. where Media Bridges is. Other communities, like the Madisonville, there's a new Madisonville Art Center that's going to open in the fall, want art for art's sake. Mm -hmm. 
And the, it's just a beautiful, abstract mm -hmm. piece of work that's very colorful that's going on, on the side of the building. So it is about engaging communities and getting feedback and presenting ideas back to them mm -hmm. um, that make them feel proud and that make them, you know, part of the creative process. Mm -hmm. So that the mural that's going to be there is going to have meaning. Uh, yeah, that, that's for, the thing. For all the participants. Yeah. Yeah. As long as it has meaning uh, to every community mm -hmm. that it's in. So mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a good deal. All right. Uh, we're just about out of time. I want you to, to give us the website and the phone number again in case okay. some parents are out there right. who want to get their kids involved in this uh, beautiful program. Artworkscincinnati.org. Art, Artworkscincinnati.org. Org, and it's A-R-T-W-O-R-K-S and then Cincinnati.org. 513-333-0388. All right. Phone well, number. I tell you what, you've been uh, great to have, and thank you. For I'm going to now. Every time I drive around the city, when I see one, I'm going to think of you. You know. <laughs> Good. Now, uh, the, where is the one located in here in Roseline? Uh, where is that again now? It, it's almost on the corner of Reading and, and Seymour. It's set back a little bit. Okay. Um, if you're coming down Seymour and you just crest in that hill, all of a sudden you see this burst of color. Okay. That's it. It's on the Serve Pro building. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, if you travel that uh, street, make sure you look out for that uh, mural there and uh, think about this program when you see it. Thank hey, you. Hey, thank you for joining me. Right, thank you. All right, appreciate that. Let's take a break, and we'll come back. And we've got Dr. John Thomas coming up, and we'll talk about the minds of a teenage criminal. We'll get inside and explore the mind. We'll be back in a moment. Live, Lincoln Where Live is the program. Of course, we're here every Sunday morning starting at 10 o'clock. You spread the word. And I see a lot of people out when I'm out and about, and they always tell me, we watch you every Sunday morning. You make me late to church. <laughs> I hate to do that. But my guest right here, Dr. John Thomas and his lovely wife, Mrs. Thomas, welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you, Lincoln. You. Now, uh, you're a what psychologist. You, psychologist. Yes. I always get psychiatrists and psychologists mixed up, but you're a psychologist. <laughs> yes. And you deal mostly with uh, adolescents? Well, I deal with uh, adults, okay. adolescents, and some children. Okay. Uh, I deal with couples and families. Okay. And my wife is an attorney in private practice, and she deals, uh, she does family law. Okay. All right. Now, we've had a recent rash of teenagers uh, committing crimes in this city. Uh, two of the most wanted people in the city are teenagers, 15 years old. Right. Why? And, and let's just take the, the, the last case here. A 15-year-old kid had an 18-year-old girl pregnant. I guess he was upset because she decided to have the baby. He, he took his boys and they went and beat her up. He stomped her in the stomach, uh, uh, fractured the fetus's skull. The fetus died and now he's uh, uh, looked after. He's a murderer. Mm -hmm. And what would make a teenager want to commit a, a crime like that? Well, Lincoln, I think there are several factors, many, many factors, actually. One fundamental factor is that child's sense of abandonment within their own family of origin. Okay, well, and, and let's stop right there. This kid's mother had been in jail 42 times. And, and that is the, prob the most probable reason why this child, this teenager, committed murder. Um, there's a a psychiatrist, a British psychoanalyst by the name of John Bowlby. And Bowlby has class, he's written like four books that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. One is called Loss, one is called Separation, one is called Attachment, and one is called The Making and Breaking of Affectional Bonds. Mm -hmm. And what Bowlby says is that when a primate, when a human being or a gorilla, monkey, whatever, is separated from someone they love, it causes them to be angry. And they show that anger, and that anger is a sign that they do not want to be separated from that person. Now, there's another man named Ken Majid who wrote a book some years ago called High Risk, Kids Who Murder. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And Majid says that fundamentally that when children, even as infants, are abandoned from their parents, what they do is, is that they wall off psychologically that sense of hurt and abandonment and they, they suppress it subconscious into their subconscious mind, but then they act it out as okay. anger later on. Hmm. Okay, so that could be, now, that, that pretty much answers why this kid did that. I mean, it, it's, it's unbelievable. Let's uh, hear from some of the callers out there. If you have questions about this, give us a call at 513-381-3838. Uh, we'll just sit there, <laughs> relax on the couch. We're going to give you a little couch time free of charge this morning. All right? We're going to help you out. Let's go to Anthony. Anthony, how you doing? I'm pretty good, Lincoln. How you doing today? Pretty good. Good, good. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for having your show. It is a, it's a marvelous show for the community here, and thank you for having the guest on. It's, it's ironic that you happened to pick up my phone and call in. I am an uh, ex-felon myself. Matter of fact, I'm opening up a reentry house for ex-felons to come out of prison, male and female. So the psychiatrist hit everything on the head, and I blame a lot of us as African-American men not taking the time to help these young men who don't have any guidance. One of our models is men sharpen men like iron sharpen iron. I was fortunate enough to have my dad raise me and teach me the right way. Some of these youths have no guidance. Their role models are drug users and athletes. They're not the ones they can talk to, like, like the uh, psychiatrist said, hands-on, one-on-one. Mentoring programs around Cincinnati is needed badly. These guys are needing big men like yourself and the psychiatrist and me to come together and pull these young men up and tell them this is not the way that you should live as a man. All right, and, and you hit on some pretty good points there. Thanks for your call. Now, could they still, uh, even if they're raised by their mother and they never have identity with their father, do they still feel that abandonment if they don't have a father in that household? Absolutely, absolutely. One of the things that has to happen is that these boys have to get into some type of therapy to work through their issues of loss and abandonment. Now the problem with boys is that a lot of times underneath the anger is depression, mm -hmm. but they can't show the depression because that means they're punk, they're weak and all of that. Mm -hmm. So what they have to do is to be able to get into some type of therapeutic uh, milieu, some type of therapeutic situation and express their hurt, express their disappointment at not being able to be uh, connected with their parents. And I've had that in my own therapy practice, Lincoln, mm -hmm. where boys have come in, they've been either violent or they've been uh, thieves. And when we get to the bottom line, their fathers were on drugs, their fathers were in prison, mm -hmm. or their mothers were out ripping and running in the streets, and they blamed themselves and acted it out on other people. Okay, let's go back to the telephones. Uh, let's go to Tyrone. Tyrone, how are you? Oh, all right. How's it going there, Lincoln? Pretty good. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm calling to uh, talk about the fact that, you know, our young people, the family have gotten to a point where we need to strengthen the families in the community. But when you have, uh, uh, oh, how, how many babies are born uh, uh, to single uh, mothers well, as Adam, compared to married couples. Well, I mean, in the black community, 70 percent of 70 percent births in the black community are born to out of wedlock births. Okay, 70 percent of all babies born in the black community are uh, out of wedlock. So there's your problem right there. And I did in fact about 20 years ago. It was in the paper where I talked about the fact that children were born out of wedlock, and. Um, one of one of the things was the fact that we still we needed that we needed to get back to old fashioned family values, and and speaking of that, that was one of the reasons that I called. It's just common sanity. I'm doing a family uh, community family love effort, where we're taking uh, families out and giving the kids opportunity to learn how to fish and swim in a lake and and just socialize. Old potluck, old fashioned. Mm -hmm. Picnic. Now, uh, and I'm sure most of the kids you're taking out are pro probably come from a single parent household. Yes, and, but you know, it's, one of the emphasis that we're putting on it is the fact of bringing the entire family, not just that child. Yeah. yeah. All right. Now, is that? Thanks for your call. Is that a substitute? Well, I think it helps. It helps yeah. to bridge the gap because it allows the kids. See, kids are egocentric, Lincoln, and what that means is that a lot of times kids feel that they are the reason why their parents aren't involved in their lives. Uh, you know, we're seeing an increase in girls actually becoming involved in the justice system. Girls are a, becoming more violent than the boys. Right. What's, what's going on with them? Well, my wife sees a lot of um, 
if she does family law, family attorney, and she sees an awful lot of marriage breakups and baby mama situations, and she was telling me about some uh, situations where she's seen boys and girls down in the court. Oh, yeah. Well, the girls have the same issues, I think, that the boys do. I mean, I'm not a psychologist. I'm an attorney, but, you know, <laughs> I, I get a lot from my husband. <laughs> but, I mean, I think that they're angry, too, because moms cannot be available for the daughters and their sons, just like yeah. dads are. And so it's the breakdown of the family structure. Kids are basically left to be to raise themselves, or it's a grandparent mm -hmm. or a great grandparent. I've had people come into my office, like at 70 years old, taking care of great great grandchildren right. yeah. because their parents are just not available or not involved. So I think it's the same factors that are coming that and are coming around to girls as well as boys, mm -hmm. and the family structure just is not there. Yeah, yeah, it's just not. Th now, how can the people reach you? By the way, if, uh, are you in the phone book? Yes, I'm in the phone book. I have a great big yellow page to add. <laughs> I forget. I'm a 221-0007. And give them your full name and... Leslie F. Thomas, attorney at law. And my husband is 961-5682. <laughs> All right, I had to get that in. All right, we're still taking your calls at 513-381-3838. Every line is busy right now. You're a popular man. People really want to get... But get back to the girls. The girls are fighting in school more than the boys are. Oh, Lincoln, the, the reason is, is that, again, girls do not feel that they are connected with their fathers. Mm -hmm. And I mean, father loss, huh? father loss. There's a, a woman by the name of Elise Wackerman. I frequently reference her book. She wrote a book called Father Loss. Mm -hmm. And in her book, she says that the girls become a, involved in abusive relationships a lot of times. And there's a lot of domestic violence mm -hmm. involved in these abusive relationships. And the reason the girls get involved in these abusive relationships is because dad left early in life. The girls, not figuring out, not knowing why dad's left, mm -hmm. blame themselves okay. and put themselves in abusive relationships until they're about the age of 40. Gee. You know what happens at the age of 40? What happens? They come to Dr. John Thomas, <laughs> they get some therapy, and they get better. Okay. I wish that were true. That is true in some cases. But in most cases, they honestly are just tired of being involved mm -hmm. in abusive relationships. The physical pain from being involved in abusive relationships caused them to stop. Why do you think they wait so long? Because they blame themselves for mm -hmm. daddy leaving, mm -hmm. and they just get tired of the pain. The, that movie, What's Love Got to Do With It, with Tina Turner, is yes. a classic example mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to Pete. Pete, good morning. How are you? Hey, how you doing, Lick? Pretty good. I just want to say one thing because I'm a single father and I have custody of three of my children. Great. Now, it's not about the father not being in the home. That Sometimes that has nothing to do with it because you have people with both parents that are still going out yep. here doing the, all the little knickknacks that with one parent is doing. That's true. Now, so I want to know why is it always the father's fault? Well, we're not saying it's the father's fault, uh, sir. We also say that a lot of times the mothers are not available either. Now, you have some families, I mean, it's not everybody in all situations, because you do have some families where both kids, both parents are in the home and kids still act out and become violent. Uh, look at the Men Menendez twins. Uh, look at the Columbine uh, oh, kids, kids, boys. Uh, look at Choi. You know, Choi had some problems, Choi. so you do Cho. Cho had some problems in himself. That's, West, that's the Virginia Tech. Yeah, right. Virginia, yeah. The, the Virginia Tech person. Mm -hmm. But you also have many, many cases, and I would say that it's almost like a paradigm or a model where lack of parent involvement um, or abusive parents, if they are involved, tend to lead kids to become criminals and be involved in violent behavior. There was a, there's a magazine called the Atlantic Monthly, and two or three years ago, several years ago, it had a, a cover story called The Code of the Streets. And in that article, it said that kids feel dissed. You've heard the term dissed, right? Somebody dissed me. Well, it means they've been disrespected. And if you psychologically go back to why those kids felt disrespected, it's because they were abused growing up. They can't act that out on their parents, so they so, act that out okay. on other people. Okay. Hey, thanks for your call. I got one real quick question. Real quick. Okay. Now, why is it that you blame kids for this stuff, but there's nothing for the children to do at certain ages? Well, certainly there are. I mean, like... Hold on. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, there are 10 tons of things that my wife can speak to that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, everything doesn't have to cost a lot of money. You can take the kids to the park. You can, you know, go to, I guess, maybe the family picnic, the church uh, picnic. A lot of families were yeah. down on Sawyer yeah. Point right. yesterday. Yeah, they, go to, yeah. they go up to uh, Eden Park and uh, an Overlook. You can go yeah. for a family walk. You can sit home and watch a DVD right. and talk about family values while you're sitting up popping the popcorn watching a DVD. A lot so, of families sing along on Friday night. They sing songs. Ooh. I mean, it, it, it sounds a little corny, but I mean, yeah, it's that just, does sound corny. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's fun. It's, I mean, but basically, it's the parent involvement. Yeah. I mean, you can have some wealthy parents too, like yeah. those two boys with Columbine. Yeah. They were from upper middle class families. Their parents weren't involved. Right. How could you have a child building a bomb in your house and you not know? You not know it. Yeah, right. that's, that's, that's something. All right, let's go back to the telephones. Allison, good morning. You're on Lincoln Wear Live. How are you? How are you? Uh, I had a comment, and it was just to say that it's, it's the breakdown of the family unit, but it's also in the community. I'm, I'm 31, and my boyfriend and I, we talk about a lot of different issues that we have socially in Cincinnati. And I think a lot of the breakdown has to do with the baby boomer generation. Their leadership died off, and they, that no one handed them the baton for them to carry on, got lazy, got comfortable because things got easy in the 80s, for them to live, and then th there was nothing that was handed to my generation, so it was kind of broken down from there. It's broken down from there as well as the respect to me and people of my generation who are trying to make life work, and they, they look at us as if we're not doing anything, trying, not trying to accomplish anything, and there, again, there's, there's not that willingness to, even if you thought that we weren't trying to do anything, pick us up from the bootstraps, keep that communication open so we can move forward. There, there's none of that anymore. And that's a problem that needs to be rectified because it's, we have to learn from our past. Our past is or are or from our elders. If we don't have that, what do we have? Well, I, I, for the most part, I think now the elders are afraid of the youth, it seems <laughs> like, you know? Uh, there was a time when the guy would go out on the corner, uh, you know, and he, he beat up some kids. But nowadays, you, you're liable to get shot if uh, you want to, you know, you go out there and try to tell these cats something. Mm -hmm. and, you know, Allison, a lot of times you have people who are grandparents by the time they're 35. I agree. I agree. So, the generation gap has, has right. narrowed. And, and these 35-year-olds, what do they know? Huh? I mean, they're, they're still out in the club partying. That's my point exactly, because we need, we need to have that leadership. And, and the people who are trying to make something of ourselves, that we, we still look downgraded on. You know, I think... That's the, the case, and it shouldn't be an excuse that our elders feel that way. It's, I mean, there's always an opportunity to make things better. Thanks for your call. What do you think, I think, well, the monolithic struggle that I think existed in the 60s with the civil rights movement, I think that what, may be what Allison is referring to to some extent. But the struggle is done. I mean, we've made some strides, and now I think the issue is everybody's trying to get their little piece of the rock. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like you're in their household, and some those who want to inculcate their youth and their uh, children with certain sorts of values can do it, and others made the choice not to do it. I need to take a quick break, and then we'll come right back. And we'll have more 513-381-3838 if ever a line becomes available, which it hardly ever does. But we'll take a break. We'll come back. Lincoln Wear Live is the program. We'll be back in a moment. We're back live. Lincoln Wear Live is the program every Sunday morning, 10 to 11, right here on It's 38. And if you know friends that have cable and they can't get us, tell them to call their cable company <laughs> and complain <laughs> that they're not on uh, Warner Cable. All right. Now, what does the hip hop culture have to do with all this teenage crime going out there? Is that maybe the main culprit in all this it's, instead of uh, single parent households? No, no, no. It's not a main culprit, Lincoln, but it's a, it's a quick runner up. It's a fast runner up because, for example, let's take uh, D, uh, what's uh, D, Run DMC yeah. back in the 80s. Yeah. Now, when Run DMC came out with regular hip hop, you know, people, it was kind of fun. Mm -hmm. But then there was some rapper who mentioned gym shoes. And everybody went out and bought the gym shoes, and the marketing people said, oh, we can market rappers in gym shoes. Then you had, uh, what's this guy's name? Um, um, 
anyway, this gin and juice guy. I can't remember oh, his name. Oh, uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, the tall guy. Snoop Dogg. Yeah, Snoop, Snoop Dogg. Dogg. Okay. Snoop Dogg did a commercial for gin and juice, and people bought gin and juice. Now, the point, um, the point I'm making is that uh, when kids see stuff on TV, mm -hmm. they emulate their models. Mm -hmm. And there was a guy, there was a, a program on Independent Lens, which is a PBS program, I guess I can say PBS, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, PBS program, and they talked about hip-hop music and African-American males. And they said that one of the things that hip-hop music does is to promote the idea of misogyny. Mm. Now, misogyny is just a fancy word for men who hate women. Mm. So this boy who killed his girlfriend who was pregnant and his boys helped him. Now, he killed the fetus. The girl lived. Oh, he killed the fetus, yeah, all right. Yeah. The guy who killed the fetus but beat up the girl real right. bad. Oh, he beat up real bad. Now, he... part of that was misogyny, mm -hmm. him hating uh, women. Now, part of that could be his hatred of his mother mm -hmm. because his mother was not available right. and him acting that out on the girls. But hip hop music and a lot of uh, a lot of songs yeah. talk about men hating women and, in general, men being violent. There's a social psychologist who is a father of social learning theory, or mm -hmm. we call it modeling, called Albert Bandura. And Albert Bandura says, we do what we see. Mm -hmm. If we're being bombarded with this stuff and not yeah. bombarded with positive stuff, then we're going to do that. So actually, uh, these hip hoppers and rappers using the N-word is really not the problem. It's what they're talking about, you know, hating women exactly. is, is a real problem. Hating women, treating women bad, you know, they, they, they applaud themselves being pimps and players mm -hmm. and using women yeah. and hurting women and all that. All they're really doing subconsciously is destroying the mothers that they hate because the mothers weren't available. All right, let's go back to the telephones. I believe Daphne is up next. Daphne, good morning. You're on Lincoln Wear Live. How are you? Hey, Daphne. I guess Daphne's not there. We'll go to... Uh, with Basich, how you pronounce your name? Bachi. Bachi, yes. How you doing? Pretty good. How you doing? Hi, Mr. and Mrs. How you doing? Fine, fine. Good. Um, my question is this. Okay. We got all this other stuff going on, but then we got these guys want to be women, and these women got to want. They dressing with these pants around their hips and. They messing up their limbs and stuff. I mean, it's all this falls into that package. And I want to ask the psychologist, what, what is this? Oh, it's you know, I really Thanks. believe, I really believe that it's a grander scheme to keep us stupid. You know, if you have all these, my wife was telling me last week, she saw this African-American boy who literally had his pants all the way down with no shirt on walking down the street. Now, we've got a radio program on the buzz, and in that radio program, uh, the, one of the callers says, well, why don't people, you know, respect us? If you're walking down the street with your pants all the way down and a shirt on, who's going to respect you? Yeah. And I think that there is a larger... Um, conspiracy, if you will, to keep us in psychological slavery by having us dress like that and act like that so that we won't take ourselves seriously, so that we won't grow up and become educated and take our place in society. All right, let's go to Bradley. Uh, I think Bradley's gone there. Okay. All right, we'll wait until we... Well, you know, Lincoln... Okay, Bradley's on four. Bradley, Bradley, how are you? Hey, how you doing, Lincoln? Pretty good, what's up? Oh, man, everything is cool, man. You know... Uh, when you talk about the hip hoppers, and you know, I, I kind of take offense to it. But, I know, I, okay. and that always happens. Anytime we say anything bad about the hip hoppers, you better believe there's a hip hop watchdog out there who's going to call in <laughs> and take offense. Go ahead, let's hear it. I'm just saying, you know, if it weren't for hip hop and Russell, people like Russell Simmons and, and Jazzy Faye, you know, all the down south rappers, you know. I mean, I'm, it's, a, it's, it's part of a little, it's exploitation in the music, but... But, but when you say it's exploitation, but <laughs> just by saying it's exploitation in itself, I mean, you, what you're doing, you're, you're saying that there is psychological genocide going on within our community, and, and it's, it's been going on for 20 years. I mean... Psychological genocide, we're killing ourselves psychologically, sir. But don't you think, don't you think, um... We need to teach each other how to, you know what I'm saying, just... Teach, gotta, teach each other what? I don't know, man. It's, it's, this subject here is so sensitive, man. I don't want to <laughs> say the wrong thing. Yeah. Me, man. 
I hear you. I hear you. But, but I think you're right, Brad. Let me, let me add a stem to what you're saying. Hang up and listen to your TV. Okay, I think we need to add a stem, which we need to teach each other how to be respectful to each other, how to... My wife does a biography on our, um, on our radio show, and it's an African-American biography. And every Saturday on the bus, what she says is that she talks about some great African-American who's done well. Many of these people have gone from rags to riches within the system within the system that we and have. And a lot of the hip hoppers have gone from rags to riches and, also. And a lot of the hip hoppers have gone from rag to riches, but at what cost, cost. psychologically yeah. Yeah. for our people. Now, when I turn on hip hop, now I watch that, um, that, I watch the one where it's My Two Cents. My Two Cents has alternative rap where they've got like Erica Baidu and some Jill Scott and some other people. They've got real positive messages about the family and helping the family be positive. But you've got a lot of uh, stations that talk about, I'm going to kill you and I've got two and three women and I'm all about the money and look at my grills and, and, and all of that, which I don't think projects a real positive image for us. Plus, it models violence. It models the type of violence that may have led to what this young man did. And it's pervasive within our community. All right, Dr. John Thomas, uh, Attorney Leslie Thomas, I'm out of time, but I'm going to have to have you back again <laughs> so we can continue to analyze the mind of the teenage criminal. <laughs> I think we did touch the surface this time. Leslie Thomas, Dr. John Thomas, thank you. Give your phone numbers out once again. Okay, I'm at 221-0007. I'm at 961-568. Two. And they're in the phone book. So uh, Dr. John Thomas, Attorney Leslie Thomas, if you need them, give them a call. <laughs> we'll take a quick break and we'll come back with the talk of the town right here on Lincoln Wear Live. I'll be right back after these important messages. Back in a moment. And we're back live. Lincoln Wear Live is the program. Time for Talk of the Town. Hey, this Saturday, the Sci Zone moves uh, one hour early. That's right. Bill Bo Shears is on at 11 p.m. instead of midnight. So you can call in all of your conspiracy uh, theories, all of your alien sightings, and all of your black helicopters at 11 o'clock on Saturday night with Bill Bo Shears. That show is something else. Uh, today at noon, Dead by Midnight, starring Timothy Hutton and uh, Susie Amos. So make sure you check that out. A rebroadcast of this show tonight at 8 o'clock on WOTH Channel 25. Make sure you check it out. A rebroadcast of this show tonight at 8, Channel 25. And uh, following this show on Channel 25 tonight, uh, it's Family Secrets. That's at 9 o'clock. And uh, until tomorrow morning. Oh, you didn't count me down? So we're out of here. Lincoln, we're live. See ya.